Most gracious and all wise God, we come before you, Lord, just saying thank you. We thank you for things being as well as they are. We thank you that we're not in the elements. We thank you that the elements are in us uh, because you have provided us with everything that we need in order for us to continue our journey here on this earth. Lord, we bless you, praise you, and magnify you. I bless you, praise you, and magnify you for each person that's on this call. I ask for your continued blessings and protection over each and every one of them, your continued uh, protection over their households, their families, their neighborhoods, Lord. You kept us in spite of ourselves. You kept us in spite of uh, things that seem to be coming at us. Uh, because you're such an awesome God. You're such a never-failing God. You're our keeper, Lord, and for that we're just thankful. Now, for this class today, Lord, I ask that you open up our minds and we may be receptive to what you would have us to learn about putting things on the altar and that we graciously share this information and that as a result of us sharing this lesson or the information that we obtain, that you get the glory that you are due because you, once again, Lord, are just such an awesome God. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic son's name. Amen. Okay. Um, we, are in, we are concluding our series entitled It's Praying Time. And we are concluding it with uh the lesson entitled is your all on the altar now um notice that after we take a look at this we're we're going to be taking a look at some showdowns that take place and in those showdowns that are going to take place we're going to see that there are some people that have to learn that there is no God like our God. Despite COVID making its rounds, despite children being crazy, despite parents uh, having to defend and redefend their children, uh, despite other things that are going on, we're, we're still going to learn that our God is still God. There is no God but Jehovah. There is a great need at present for men and women to rebuild our altars. In other words, to call back God to some things. We need to call back, call God back to our children. Because it seems that many of them are out of hand. And we found every excuse in the world not to bring them back. Uh, anytime a six-year-old gets a handgun, knows how to use the handgun, and shoots his teacher, we, things are out of hand. We also need to call back our churches because our church has lost its direction. Now, what do I mean? Am I talking about the building that we worship in? No. I'm talking about the body of believers. We've sort of wandered away. We have found every excuse in the world to keep from worshiping our true and living God. Our community needs to be put on the altar. Gun violence is out of control. Anytime there's a shooting on the grounds of a church, you know things are out of out of control. Our community uh, is accepting of people living out on the streets to the point that we've become insensitive to those who don't have boarded up houses an all time high. And now there are people breaking in those boarded up houses and setting fires. Then we have just an overall waiver of commitment. Our commitment to some things is gone. The meeting place in the home is gone. 
So, the altar is what is the meeting place with God. If the altar represented the time and space for an encounter with God, it, it makes you wonder how and when, as a body of believers, we are to meet him today. It's where you climb Mount Moriah to give your Isaacs up to God. What is your Isaac? What do you need to put on the altar? Anything that comes before God needs to be put on the altar. Sometimes it's sickness, sometimes it's sadness, sometimes it's sorrow. There's a whole list of things that we need to be placing on the altar. It's also a place of sacrifice. It's a place where things need to be put to death. And it's a place of consecration. Now, the altar is a product of the where it comes to the modern evangelical church. Preachers from the 19th century, like Charles Finney, used to invite people to come to a wooden sacrifice or wooden uh, piece of wood called the altar. And it was at that location that people professed Christ and Jesus Christ. Neither the altar nor the act of walking down the aisles is actually going to change people. But this evangel evangelistic method provided a platform for people to proclaim their commitment to God as a result of their transformation. Now, in churches across America and around the world, the altars become a place for decision, a place for encounter, worship, sacrifice, reflection, repentance, change, confession, declaration, accountability, uh, celebration, revelation, empowerment, and passion. Because time at the altar reminded us that Jesus meets our every need and is worthy of all our devotion. We should be approaching the altar as Paul describes in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where he says we are to, it, it says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, you know, that eating, sleeping, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and respond to it quickly. Unlike the culture all around you, always dragging you down to this level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So it seems like we're losing that altar. We're losing that taking things and placing it before God. And I'm not talking about that carved piece of furniture um, we're in danger of allowing other things to replace that altar. Um, so, as we're taking a look at our lesson today, what was the spiritual atmosphere at that time? Well, the people were corrupt. The leadership in our lesson, Ahab and Jezebel, were the was the most wicked couple in the Bible because they led Judah into adultery. They forsook God and followed Baal. Jezebel blatantly honored and supported the priest of Baal. She was more zealous for God, I mean for Baal, than Ahab was for God. Idolatry had been a 
problem over and over and over again in Israel. And it gravitated in whatever direction the wind of popular opinion blew. The crazy part is today, we're in that same spiritual condition. Whatever way the wind is going to blow, that's the way that we're going to be turning. They're really confused about who God really is and sometimes whether he even exists. So why would Jezebel be more loyal and supportive of her gods than we are of the true and living God? It's easy to believe. It's easier to believe in a lie that caters to your fancy. When you have no conviction, it's either to have it your way. Um, when it suits us, it also makes it easier for us to believe. Why would people believe Trump's lie over the reality of the truth? Well, what do we still have in Congress? McConnell. He's done, just because he's done some things to help others, there are plenty of other things that he's done to hurt people. So, are we accepting of what God allows and not praying sufficiently? You know, that question gets to be an old question. Why does evil succeed? And it is because good men aren't doing anything. Darkness can only come in when the light goes out. The church is praying for our agenda, not thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, what are they doing in heaven that we're not doing on earth? We need to wait for some marching orders. Because uh, we like to argue, uh, we, we don't ask for his will. We we ask for what we want. We want God to bless our yeah, our mess. Because many times His will might coincide with our will. So we need to turn the light from heaven on ourselves. The nation, back then, just like today, has a habit of honoring people who deserve none. We give accolades to preserve movie stars and to elevate people to hero status and athletes and politicians who live ungodly and perverted lives. Well, our lesson proper is from 1 Kings 17. But you have to fully understand what's going on. When you start reading 1 Kings 16, the kingdoms have been split. The northern kingdom never had a godly king. It's called Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah and maybe had six or eight godly kings. Because a few of the godly kings, they started in existence uh, a while longer than those in the northern kingdom. Well, King Ahab comes in power in Israel. Ahab sins against God. All sin is against God. But he sinned more than any of his predecessors. And to make matters worse, who did he marry? He married Jezebel. He worshipped Baal. They went crazy. His dad was Omri. He was the king of Samaria. So that's why the Samaritans are messed up. Jezebel's father, father was Isabel. He was the king of the Sidonians, which was the capital of Baal worship. Uh, Ahab built an altar to Baal and worshipped Baal. He allowed Jericho, which had been destroyed by Joshua, he, okay, Joshua destroyed Jericho, 
and Joshua put a curse on Jericho, but Ahab had Jericho rebuilt in spite of the curse. And God was sick and tired of Ahab. So, what does he do? He sends a prophet, Israel's greatest prophet, Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe. Elijah's name means the Lord is God. And his ministry as a prophet was to oppose the worship of Baal in Israel and deal with the sin and idolatry of Ahab. Because God was displeased with Israel, he sent Ahab, I mean Elijah to Ahab, to tell him that there would be no rain for three years. He sent Elijah on a mission. The brook where Elijah was sent dried up because God wanted Elijah to move. Sometimes we don't move and everything seems to be in place. So, Elijah's, uh, here we go, Jezebel's evil influence and Ahab's leadership led the nation of Israel into idol worship. 1 Kings 16.33 says he made the God of Israel angrier than any than all the previous kings of Israel put together. Because it was always a dark time. But God always raised up somebody to be the light. Well, Elijah was, I was geared to ask the question about are you letting your light shine? But I'll talk about that in a little bit. Elijah was a voice in the wilderness and light in the darkness. He stood in the gap for God when it was suicidal to do so. He needed more heroes like him, and we need more heroes like him, especially in our sin-sick society. In Exodus 5 and 2, Pharaoh asked a question that many have asked about God, and God's about to answer the question. Pharaoh asked, and who is God that I should listen to him and send Israel off? I know nothing of this so-called God, and I'm certainly not going to send Israel off. Well, what did Pharaoh learn? He learned exactly who uh, this unknown God is, this so-called God. There's always been a contest between the true and living God and those other gods that we have in the Bible. So, uh, many times we could uh, be like the announcers for the wrestling when they ask the question, are you ready to rumble? Well, the question is, are you ready to rumble with God? We see in Exodus chapter 7, verses 10 through 12, there is the battle between the God of Israel and the God of the Egyptians. And in Numbers 33 and 4, we see the result. They've been warned. But in Numbers 33 and 4, it says, Meanwhile, the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn sons, whom the Lord had killed the night before. The Lord had defeated the gods of Egypt that night and the great acts with great acts of judgment. Then we see in 1 Samuel chapter 5, the God of Israel versus the God of the Philistines. His name is Dagon. Um, so they had learned that God's arms were too short to box with God because what ended up happening, uh, the Philistines had seized the chest of God. They took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, brought it into the shrine of Dagon. And placed it alongside the idol of Dagon. The next morning when the citizens of Ashdod got up, they were shocked to find out Dagon was toppled on his face, flat on his face before the chest of God. 
They picked him up and put him back where he belonged. First thing the next morning, they found him again, toppled on his face before the test of God. This time, his arms and uh, head were broken off, and they were strewn across the entrance. Also, the torso was in one piece. That's why today, the priests of Dagon and the visitors of the Dagon Shrine in Ashdod avoid stepping on the threshold. God was hard on the citizens of Ashdod. He devastated them by hitting them with tumors. This happened in both the town and the surrounding neighborhoods. He let loose rats among them, jumping from ships there. Rats swarmed all over the city, and everyone was deathly afraid. When the leaders of Ashdod saw what was going on, they decided, Ooh, <laughs> this chest of God has to go. This chest of God of Israel has to go. We can't handle this, and neither can our God take on. Wait a minute. So if your God is the real thing, then why is the true and living God overpowering it? Well, they're, once again, they find out. They call together all the Philistine leaders and put it to them. How can we get rid of this chest of God of Israel? The leaders agreed, move it to Gath. So they moved the chest of God of Israel to Gath. But as soon as it moved there, God came down hard on that city too. It was mass hysteria. He hit them with tumors. Tumors broke out everywhere in the young, in, in the town, and the young and the old. So they sent the chest of God to Ekron. But as soon as the chest was being brought into town, they said, ah, you're going to kill us by bringing that chest of God. Mm -mm, Y'all not doing that. So they called the Philistine leaders together, get it out of here. And this chest of God of Israel, send it back to where it came from, were threatened with mass death. Everywhere, everyone was scared to death when the chest of God showed up. God was already coming down very hard on the place. Those who didn't die were hit with tumors. All of the city cries of pain and lament fill the air. So, the next episode that we see, uh, the next battle, is the God of David versus the God of Goliath. And we know how that ended up. Then we have the God of Philip versus the God of Simon. In Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 13, uh, a man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be some, someone great. Everyone, from the least to the greatest, often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. So, we also see in Colossians uh, chapter 2, um, it says, when you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven. The slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all of the tyrants, spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the street. So don't put up with anyone pressuring you into the details of diet, worship services, or holy days. 
All of those are mere shadows cast before what was to come, the substance of Christ. Don't tolerate people who try to run, run your life, ordering you to bow and scrape. Instead, that you join their obsession, insisting that you enjoy their obsession with angels and that you seek out visions. They are a lot of hot air. That's all they are. So, you saw time and time again episodes of people's arms that were too sharp to box with God. So now we come to 1 Kings chapter 18. And there is a little showdown that takes place. Uh, but before the showdown does, uh, we're told about things were being scornful. Uh, starting, well, I'm start with verse 1. Long time had passed. Then God's word came to Elijah. The drought was now in its third year. So remember I told you for three and a half years, there was not to be any rain. Ahab had been looking for Elijah. Elijah was hiding right in plain sight. So after three and a half years, Elijah comes out of plain sight. And Ahab was not happy to find him. He'd sent uh he had sent Obadiah to look for him. So, uh, verse 1 says, A long time had passed, then God's word came to Elijah. The drought was in his third year. The message, go and present yourself to Ahab. I'm about to make it rain on the country. Elijah sent out, uh, set out to present himself to Ahab. The drought in Samaria at that time was the most severe. Ahab called for Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah feared God, and he was very devout. Earlier, when Jezebel had tried to kill off all the prophets of God, Obadiah was the one that had hid them away, a hundred of them in two caves, fifty in a cave, and then supplied them with food and water. Ahab ordered Obadiah, go through the country, locate every spring and stream. Let's see if we can find enough grass to keep our horses and mules from dying. So they divided the country between them for a search. Ahab went one way, Obadiah went the other. Obadiah was on, went on his way, and suddenly there he was, Elijah. Obadiah fell to his knees, bowing in reverence and exclaiming, Is it really you, my master Elijah? Yes, said Elijah, the real me. Now go and tell your boss I've seen Elijah. Obadiah said, But what have I done to deserve this? Ahab will kill me. As surely as God lives, there isn't a country or kingdom where my master hasn't sent out a search party looking for you. And if they said, we can't find him, we've looked high and low, he would make that country or kingdom swear that you were not to be found. And now you're telling me, go and tell my master, Elijah's found? The minute I leave you, the Spirit of God will whisk you away to who knows where. Then when I report to Ahab, you have disappeared and Ahab will kill me. I've I've served God devoutly since the day I was a boy. Hasn't anyone ever told you that what I did to Jezebel was out, was out, uh, when Jezebel was out to kill the prophets of God, how I risked my life by hiding a hundred of them, fifty to a cave, and made sure they had food and water? And now you're telling me to draw attention to myself by announcing to my master Elijah's been found. Why, he killed me for sure. Elijah said, As surely as the God of angel armies lives, and before whom I take my stand, I'll meet your master face to face this very day. So Obadiah went straight to Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to, out to meet Elijah. The moment Ahab saw Elijah, he said, So... 
It's you, old troublemaker. It's not I who has caused trouble in Egypt. I mean, in Israel, Elijah said. But you and your government, you dumped God's ways and commands and ran after the local gods, the Baals. So, first thing we see is the scornful. When we are wrong, we have a tendency of pointing the finger at others. My dad always said, when you point a finger with others, you have three fingers pointing back at you. Ahab sees Elijah and is not happy, calls him a troublemaker. And a troublemaker is a person who stirs up discord, disturbs others, agitates, causes mental agitation or distress. In fact, Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, I can't impress this on you too strongly. God is looking over your shoulder. Christ himself is the judge with the final say in everyone living and dead. He is about to break in he is about to break into the open with his rule. So proclaim the message with intensity. Keep on your watch. Challenge, warn, and urge people. Don't ever quit. Just keep it simple. And in Acts chapter four, verse thirty one. We find that while they were praying, the place where they were meeting trembled and shook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak God's word with fearless confidence. So, here's our point to ponder. You have realized that you get into when you are when you finally decide to get serious about serving God. When you are 100% sold out, you're viewed as a troublemaker. Why are you viewed as a troublemaker? Star six to respond. I have to speak up. When I see something wrong. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, many times uh, we should want to be known as a troublemaker because we should want to be known for one who makes trouble for the devil. We should want to make it hard for people to go to hell. We should want to make it hard for people, depressed people, to stay depressed. We should want to make it hard for God's people to stay broke. We should want to make it hard for false prophets to fatten their pockets by preying on the ignorance of God's people. That's what we should be about as being a troublemaker. Well... Here's point to ponder number two. Most people are satisfied living around the altar. But when you are chosen to live on the altar as a living sacrifice, you know, putting that everyday part of your life before God, what is the difference in between what is the difference to you between living around the altar and living on the altar? Star six to respond. Living around the altar, Dave, my thought is you're not doing what you should be doing, where if you're living on the altar, 
You're doing God's work. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. How about this? When we're living around the altar, we don't have to give anything up. We don't have to burn anything. There you go. We we can check off our boxes. I went to Wednesday service check. I went to Sunday service check. And that's enough for me. Uh... But when we're living, there are some things that we used to do, we don't do them no more. It ain't because we can't. It's, we just decide not to do them that way. Uh, we, we don't act the same. But living around the altar, nothing has changed. We have not died to self. We want what we want always. So, people can't tell the difference between us and the world. We need to check ourselves many times, as the saying says, before we work ourselves, because when we live on the altar, we don't allow some things. We don't allow some gossip coming our way. We don't allow certain jokes. And that late night creeping, that, that's definitely a no-no. So, we see in First Kings chapter 18, we go from uh, the scornful to the summons. Verse 19, now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 250 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asher, who are supported by Jezebel. Here's what I want you to do. Assemble everyone at, in Israel at Mount Carmel and make sure they are the special pets of Jezebel. The 450, uh, the 400 and the 50 prophets at your, of your local gods, the Baals, and the 400 prophets who, uh, who are the prophets of the whore at goddess Asherah are there. Make sure they're there. So, this summons, uh, he says, gather your prophets for a showdown in Mount Carmel. Why Mount Carmel? Well, it's a stronghold. It's a large mountain, and whoever controls Mount Carmel controls the northern half of the nation militarily and politically. There are times that we have to go in a stronghold of the enemy to win the battle. And whoever controls Carmel, Mount Carmel, controls the nation spiritually, so militarily, politically, and overall spiritually. The so years earlier, the idol worshipers tore down the altar to God and erected a giant altar to Baal. So Baal worship was degrading religion. Uh, there are many things that are promoting wickedness around us. Uh, sometimes it's drugs, sometimes it's alcohol, sometimes it's musical beds. The mixture of idolatry, perverted sexuality, and child sacrifice. That's what they were experiencing. Uh, they worshipped the idols of Baal and Asherah. These gods supposedly controlled agriculture, weather, and fertility. Um, with the agriculture, they gnashed themselves against the altar to gash themselves to make crop grow, crop roads, blood sacrifice, fertility. Virgins would have sex with priests before marrying to increase their fertility. And the child sacrifice was a very common practice. Uh, 
uh, when you demanded an answer for a prayer. Now, why could you be praying for that? Uh, why, why would you be praying that you would throw your child in the fire? So, anyway. Uh, the next we see is there was Philem. First Kings 18, 20, 21. So, Ahab summoned everyone in Israel, particularly prophets, to Mount Carmel. Elijah challenged the people. How long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is a real God, follow him. If Baal, if it's Baal, follow him. Make up your mind. Nobody said a word. Nobody made a move. And notice that there is silence for generations. Israel has been trying to worship Jehovah and Baal at the same time. They want it both ways. They want the power of Jehovah, but want to enjoy the decadence of Baal. And Elijah is calling them to make a choice. He's telling them that they cannot worship both. God is not going to allow it. Those who attend the church but are not a part of the church. They are convicted, but not convinced. They're not born again. There's no decision for Christ. So... Uh, Matthew six twenty four says you can't worship two gods at one time. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Because the adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. So, here's our next point to ponder. Is it physically impossible to straddle a fence in the physical world? If it is, why do we think it's possible in the spiritual world? Once again, if it is physically possible, impossible to straddle a fence in the physical world, why do we think it's possible in the spiritual world? Star six to respond. I think it's because most people don't know the difference. And they don't know the problems that can come about when they do. Okay. Well, my next question is going to be likened unto it. How do we? How are we straddling the spiritual fence today, or are we? Star six to respond. Dave, I think we struggle because sometimes I think that we know better, but we don't do better. Okay. We don't know or we don't care to do. We don't care to do that. All right. Yes, sir. When we're pretending, nobody calls us out. We think it's okay. All right. I think it's also about how we allow God to use us instead of letting others use us. Okay. So, here's the question. Does that mean we're attached to anything? We're committed to anything? It's crazy that many times 
more committed to the church than we're committed to Christ. When you're committed to Christ, there's some other things that won't be taking place, like houselessness, like an evangelical religion electing a man that doesn't uh, care for anybody. Well, how do the people respond? Not a word. That's the picture of America today. The church is silent as a nation, and it continues to march deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into immorality and injustice. It was the church that went to the forefront in dealing with injustice, but now it's quiet. The people don't understand because we've not taken a stance. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 7 says there's an, impetute, there's an opportune time to do things, a right time for everything on the earth, a right time to rip out another to mend, a right time to shut up and another to speak up. So what's even worse is church folk, have become so immoral that you can't tell the difference in the church folk and the lost folk. The church is walking with the world. You cannot run with the devil all week and stand with Jesus only on Sunday. You can't go to bed with Satan and then wake up with Jesus. So it's time for America to choose. It's time for our world to choose. It's time for the church to choose. And most importantly, it's time for us to choose. Exodus 32:26 says, He took me up to position at the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever's on God's side, join me. All the Levites stood up. And then Joshua 24 and 15, he said, if, if you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worshipped from the country beyond the river, or one of the gods of the Amorites, or those on whose land you're living. As for me and my family, we'll worship God, because God warns us about indecision. Choices have consequences. Matthew 12:30 says, and anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is directly working against me. So we go from the scornful to the summons to silence to now we're going to see the showdowns. And basically there are two showdowns that we're going to take a look at, and we're going to be through. 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 22. Then Elijah said, I'm the only prophet of God left in Israel, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. Let the prophets of Baal bring up two oxen, let them pick one, butcher it, lay it out on the altar of wood, firewood, but don't ignite it. I'll take the other, cut it up, lay it on the wood, but neither will I light the fire. Then you pray to your gods, and I'll pray to God. The God who answers with fire will prove to me, in fact, God. Prove to me, in fact, God. All the people agreed. Oh, that, that's a good plan. Let, let, let's do that. Elijah told the prophets of Baal, cut up your ox and prepare it. You go first. You're the majority. Then pray to your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the ox he had given them, prepared it on the altar, then prayed to Baal. They prayed all morning long. Oh, Baal, answer us! But God, I mean, but nothing happened. Not so much as a whisper of a breeze. Desperate, they jumped and stomped on the altar they had made. By noon, Elijah started making fun of them, calling, taunting. Call a little louder. He's a god after all. He may be off meditating somewhere or maybe he's gotten involved in the project or maybe he's on vacation. 
You don't suppose he overslept, do you? And needs to be waked waked up. So, uh, I, I love one of the other translations says, well, maybe he's out relieving himself. Verse 28. They prayed louder and louder, cutting themselves with swords and knives, a ritual common to them until they were covered with blood. This went on well past noon. They used every religious trick and strategy they knew to make something happen on the altar, but nothing happened. Not so much as a whisper. Not a flicker of a response. That was round one. That was Baal's time. So Elijah challenges them, the prophets of Baal. They're accepting of this challenge, and it gets crazy. So here's the first thought. This is a picture of the futility of and the idolatry of false worship. The prophets of Baal prayed and did all they can to arise action. They even went so far as to mutilate their bodies because shedding blood was an attempt to satisfy the Baal, the god Baal. So, all false gods are that just that false. They don't exist, not really, not possessing life. They're powerless, unable to respond. So, what are some of the false gods we're depending on today? Star six to respond. Democrats. Yes, sir. What are some others? The entertainment system. All right. Any others? Gaming. All right. Food. Food, drugs, alcohol, the biggie, the lottery. Shopping. Shopping. Most definitely. And don't leave out musical beds. <laughs> All right. So then we see round two. Round two is God's turn. And the prophets of Baal, the prophets of God, calling the people to come close as they could. Elijah rebuilt an offer on Mount Carmel that had been lying in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones to represent or symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to build the altar. He rebuilt the altar. He knew that it would bring Israel back to the altar and the altar back to Israel. Then he could bring them back to God. This is where we are in America right now. The greatest structure that we can build in America is to rebuild, not rebuild our highways. Uh, it is to rebuild in every city, in every church, in every home. It's the structure called the altar. And the altar is where we place things that need that separate us from God. So, Elijah has his first altar. He calls the people to the altar. After the men had doused the altar with water, Elijah stepped forward and began to pray. And note that he prayed for three things. Uh, verse 36. When it's time for the sacrifice to be offered, Elijah came up and prayed, O oh God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Make it known right now that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I'm doing what I'm doing under your order. 
Answer me, O God, O answer me, and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. Immediately, I love that, the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, even the water in the drench. How do you burn up water? That was a mighty fire. And all the people saw it and fell on their faces, exclaiming, God is the true God. God is the true God. He prayed for three things. Prove that he is God alone. Prove that Elijah was God's true servant. And that the Lord hear and answer his prayer so the people would know God is God. So, here's that question. Is your all on the altar? What are some of those things that need to be burned up? How about pride? How about our agendas? How about our time? How about our ministry? All these things, when they are relating to self, need to be put on the altar. So, as we conclude our lesson today, there are lots of things that you see there in that graphic that need to be put on the altar. But we also see that there are some things that that altar should contain. That altar should be built on the Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. That altar should contain the instructions to evangelists, pastors, teachers, apostles, and prophets. That altar should also be built on exhortation, giving, ruling, mercy, teaching, ministry, and prophecy. Not our ministry, but the ministries that God has given us. And it should involve discerning of spirits, prophecy, interpretation of tongues, Miracles, various tongues, words of wisdom, faith, words of knowledge, and healing. So all of the things that are there to produce our altar. So give some thought as to what in your life needs to be put on the altar. Once placed on the altar, make sure you leave it there. Don't pick it back up. Be prepared to be an intercessor for those in need of rescue or deliverance. Share with others how Christ came to incinerate those things in our lives that are not like him. Be an obedient giver. There are some things that you'll have to take to the altar and be prepared to alter some other things. Don't confuse with what you need to burn up in your life with what you need to change. Either way, put it in God's hands. Next week, we begin a new series. And that new series is Be About Going. We will be talking about the tears of a soul winner. And our primary scripture will be coming from Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. So, I thank you for joining us today. I pray that you will take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. I pray that you will know what needs to go on the altar. Love each and every one of you. And look forward to hearing from you next week. You have lost the sweet peace and for faith to increase and have Leave every praise.
But you cannot have forever. I be firmly blessed until all the altar is back. Is your on the altar the sacrifice of the Only be blessed and find peace and find peace and sweetness as you yield your body and oh yeah. request, Lord. 
Oh, God, we ask you to grant it in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, we ask you to look on our teacher, David, Lord. God, continue to bless him, continue to strengthen him, continue to open up doors and make ways for him, Lord. Oh, God, everyone on this line, meet the need of your people everywhere. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen.